Alicia. Hi, everybody. My name is Rose Roscoe, and I want to welcome you to Betsy's webinar today entitled Empowering Writers with Word Key Support. So today we have two special guests with us, um, which are vendors for Quillsoft Company. We have John DeLuca and Nick Askew. And so we just to introduce ourselves a little bit. Uh, so I'm an occupational therapist and AT specialist with the Special Ed Technology Center and also with Bellevue School District. And we've been using uh, WordQ, SpeakQ products for the last several years um, and recently just bumped up to 70 uh, licenses district-wide this year. So we're really kind of driving in deeper on how we can use this as a UDL tool and really support students with the writing process. Um, so I asked um, John and Nick if they would join us for a webinar so they could really help me and you all uh, understand better how to use this tool and all its wonderful capabilities because there's much more to this tool than I thought originally. So um, anyway, this company is uh, from Toronto, Canada. Uh, they serve the United States obviously as well. And I want to introduce John and Nick. So take it away. Thank you so much, Rose. Nick, I'll let you begin. Certainly. So I'm Nick. Uh, I got my start in assistive technology over a decade ago. I actually started here in Canada with the Toronto District School Board. I uh, handled assistive technology training for hundreds of different students with various learning disabilities. So I had a chance to touch upon all sorts of different software out there, WordQ being one of them. And I ended up joining uh, John uh, full time with the company that was handling the distribution for WordQ at that time. And given my personal experience and chance to actually work firsthand uh, with all those kids, I knew it was something that I always want to be involved in because I've had that chance to see just how much of a difference it can make in people's lives and to have those experiences uh, firsthand. It's, it's absolutely amazing what you can do with the technology these days and um, just being able to help people communicate and get their ideas out effectively. I know John feels the exact same way. Yeah, believe firmly in that at Quillsoft. All of us are fully on board with that, and we believe um, very, very strongly in what our software can do. And so today we're going to show you a little bit of that, and hopefully um, from this you'll take away or perhaps think of somebody that can benefit from the software in the long run. Over to you, John. Thank you, Nick. Um, so my name is John DeLuca. I'm actually the president of Quillsoft. Uh, Big title, but basically what I'm doing is uh, handling the pedagogical portions of what we do at Quillsoft. Uh, I come to you with 17 years of teaching experience at all grade levels, uh, elementary and secondary, uh, in the special education area, and a consultant for assistive technology for the final three years of my uh, educational career, uh, which then took me into meeting the owners and the developers of WordQ, uh, which I was using ex extensively in my classrooms. So a lot of what you're going to hear today is my own experiences with the software um, and where I see it as a general tool for learning rather than just a niche tool for those students who maybe are diagnosed with a, a learning disability or a challenge in, in learning. So um, as I mentioned, after the 17 year career it took me into uh, Quill Software, WordQ became part of my baby as well. Um, I worked with Nick. Uh, we were both uh, helping to run special education training on all kinds of uh, programs and software that would assist students in a, in a UDL, UDL environment. So you'll see us refer to UDL quite a bit as we move on today. Um, we only have an hour and uh, I'm Italian and I like to hear myself speak. And so I'll try to crunch into one hour what I can possibly crunch into it. Uh, but it's great to know that Rose has this being recorded as well. So if anything's being missed, you can always catch up later. Um, I will be providing Rose with some documents afterwards that she can provide to you. So a lot of what you'll see today is in a document um, that you will get and have access to so that if you've got any more questions, um, you'll have something to rely upon moving forward. Okay. Okay. I just, one more thing before you start. Um, we have a chat window. I, hopefully most of you are familiar with that already. So if you're on with us live and you have a question, for Nick or John, please, or myself, please just put it in the chat window and I'll be monitoring that and I will pause occasionally and we'll try to answer your questions. Um, and then also just really appreciating, we did a lot of pre-planning and talking about how does WordQ fit into universal design for learning. And really when you're teaching WordQ or any word prediction, 
what is the writing process involved to get children to succeed? And I think John and Nick spent some time thinking about that and creating some new support documents, which I'm really excited about. So I just wanted to say um, this was a great collaborative process, but even though they'll be talking, um, I'm really excited about the direction we're going, so. Fantastic. Yeah. So this quote pretty much resonates what we are all about at Quillsoft that there is no greater agony than bearing an untold story that's inside of you. And how many times do we meet students who can tell us fantastic stories and we know they've got it in there somewhere, but something is stopping them from transferring that out to us so that we can either hear it or see it um, on screen. And so uh, Maya Angelou kind of had it right. So we're hoping that through this presentation, you'll see where we believe that we can help students to have a voice, that they can tell that story that they might've had trouble telling prior to because they can't get it out on paper or they can't get it out on the screen. So we firmly believe in those students that we know are capable of doing quite well. They just don't have the tools to allow them to show us what they actually truly know. And so unfortunately as teachers and educators, we're kind of stuck because unless we have proof that the student knows the expectations or the outcomes that we need them to achieve, uh, it's difficult to give them those the grades that they deserve. WordQ helps with that. WordQ helps them to be able to get their ideas out so that once they're out, then we can truly understand what it is that they know and they can be rewarded for that. So a lot of the words that you're going to hear us use today are things like worthiness, acceptance, appreciation, um, happiness, contentedness. Those are the things that students have told us they feel after using WordQ. Okay. So let's introduce it. It's right better with more confidence and independence. And you'll hear that quite a bit as we move along today as well. So it supports elementary and secondary students originally in our K to 12 versions. And then we realize that our students grow up. And so they forced us to introduce something called WordQ Pro that once they leave secondary and move on to post-secondary and into the business world, that we've got a tool for them that does exactly the same thing that the tool did when they were in elementary and secondary, but provides them that word prediction at a different higher level. So we recognize that this is a sustainable product. It's one that they can grow with and will grow with them. So it basically consists of state-of-the-art word prediction, and we'll put our word prediction up against anybody else's word prediction. Uh, speech feedback with a clear auditory voice, it's an a cappella voice, a uh, choice between a male and a female. The ability to actually proofread, which a lot of people don't realize WordQ has the ability to do that for students. So when we move into secondary and into post-secondary, the idea is that you've got a built-in peer editor. Enhanced topical web searches, the ability for you to be able to use the internet to very quickly grab words that are based upon the topic you're writing and have those words affect the prediction list and take priority. Uh, and other unique technologies that you'll see as we go through today. Again, all supporting the UDL environment. We firmly believe in that whole idea that every student should have the right to succeed at the level that they're at. If we need to provide them a tool to allow them to do it for themselves, then that's what we're going to do. We're going to provide that tool for them to let them work independently enough so they don't have to rely upon the teacher, the teacher's assistant, or mom and dad for certain things that they know they could do on their own if they had the assistance to do it. So teachers then have the time and freedom to be able to focus on and help students to work and learn more specifically. We know we all have those students in our room that need us a little bit more than some of the others do. So instead of having a line of 20 students waiting for us, 15 of those students can go work independently to get the words that they require rather than wasting their time waiting for the teacher. That allows the teacher to go specifically and target those students who might need a little bit more at that moment. So WordQ has always offered, it's always been in there that we have advanced word prediction that helps with spelling and grammar. There's three levels of vocabulary that you can begin with, starter, intermediate, or advanced. The nice thing is once you begin the first time, WordQ takes it from there. It basically guides the student and builds a profile of writing style for that student as they grow in confidence in writing. There's a background dictionary of about 80,000 linguistically aligned words and phrases that are appropriate for both elementary and secondary. And again, you don't have to worry about profanity because everything is bias free as well. It's a very, very simple and easy to use interface that supports offline writing. So the idea is you don't need the internet to get the word prediction and the speech feedback up and functional. It's a very high quality speech feedback. As I mentioned earlier, we take acapella voices that we know are crisp and clear. 
Then the proofreading mode, which has always been there, guiding students to readily find and correct spelling and grammar mistakes. Many times students can use the auditory functions to be able to hear where they may have made a mistake, but they don't have the tool to be able to make that correction. WordQ offers that instantly. So the new word Q, five, which for some of you is the only word Q you'll ever know, uh, but we're very, very proud of what we've been able to do because we've introduced something called dynamic topic lists that change in real time. And that takes into consideration something called the thought Q technology, which we've had around for quite a few years. We just couldn't figure out where to actually interject it into the use of word Q. It actually came from the students. They told us as they became very confident e emergent writers that they needed more. They needed help to be able to go find information that they could actually fill their minds with so that they had something to write. Um, on the PC side, which you will see today, there is on-demand speech to text and it's done in a really neat way. Because we understood the students that we were working with in the original onset of WordQ and creation of it, we recognized that the speech, speak Q technology had to be just as flexible, but very simple to use. So you'll see, you'll see some of that as we move up, move on to the uh, presentation here. I'm also going to very quickly introduce you a rare, really free tool at the moment. And we showed this to Rose, and I think she was pretty impressed um, with what it did, but it's called ReaderQ. And it actually works to help students be able to paraphrase um, articles that they might read on the internet with the assistance knowing that they're getting assistance with plagiarism and that the document that they end up creating will be pretty free from plagiarism because we'll protect them against that. The other piece that it also includes is that we've introduced subscription-based pricing as well as our perpetual pricing. And you'll hear more about that as we move on. All right, so what's new to WordQ5? So, Another piece that uh, we just recently did, and that's why it's got a slide of its own, and we also think that it's pretty powerful in terms of what it does, is we've got an option to be able to use an open PDF uh, document, meaning you can bring in a PDF, and we'll talk about this as we move a little bit forward and you'll see it. But we've shown districts that they can save a lot of money on OCR our programs by doing something on the photocopiers they already have that will allow WordQ to interact with that PDF using all of the accessibility tools that we can use in a Word document. So you'll see some more of this as we move forward as well. Our privacy promise. One thing that's really huge in the US and in Canada as well is that we take registered emails, but they're only used to verify the account. Once it's verified, then it's encrypted and we never see it again. We do not take any information from the student that would uh, cause us to cross that privacy line. So we're pretty proud of that fact as well. Now, looking at the writing process, we always know that when we look at it, we, we tend to look at it sometimes in a linear fashion, but we know that it's not. It's very cyclical and it's very recursive, meaning that we go in and out of these stages at various points of the writing process. And that could be just a sentence. It could be just a paragraph. When the student starts to uh, begin to become an emergent writer, they're doing this process even in a short amount of text. And so it's something that we build upon with them as we go through. The word queue can be there now at every stage of the writing process where we feel the gaps are. And we know that there are gaps in the writing process where students can use some assistance. We hope that we can be there doing this. And again, I'm going to provide you with this slideshow so that you're going to be able to have it for yourself or access to it anyway. Universal design for learning. Rose? Hi. I'm just curious, um, one of the, the areas I'm finding my students really need support in that pre-writing and drafting phase is being graphic organizers and there's not really a lot of tools out there right now um, that are doing that. Do you have any plans or do you have anything like that for brainstorming that you can share as you're going along? Yep. Um, so, chat? Ac excellent question. Um, basically, we used to be the Canadian distributor for inspiration software. Remember that beautiful, wonderful graphical organizer? Yes. Um, that is still available, but it's starting to wear thin because of the operating system changes on the PCs yes. and the Macs. Well, we still believe it was probably the best graphic organizer there because it allowed WordQ to work with it flawlessly. So uh -huh. we always thought of inspiration as the two pieces of yes. the pie the visual organization and the structural organization of the writing. But it didn't have the third component, which was how do you put detail into those boxes and into those areas if you don't know or are not confident in writing? And so when we put WordQ over top of a program like that, we now get word prediction and speech feedback, which adds that third component that now makes the whole writing process supported. So 
we just found out that Idea Mapper is a brand new program that's out there. So it's Idea, M A P P E R. Okay. And you can take inspiration documents and actually import them into Idea Mapper so that all of your old inspiration documents are now able to be imported. You may have to fix the visual. It'll all be there, but you may have to rearrange the structure of the writing. Right. And we tested WordQ with it, and it works flawlessly. So we're really right. happy about that. And that so, is that a website and an app or just an app? It's, uh, you can get both, but if you go and search Idea Mapper, uh, you can actually download Idea Mapper right to your desktop. As a matter of fact, I have the trial version on my PC here, uh, and I've been working with it, and it's quite good in terms of what it's able to do. So Thanks. further to that, You'll see as you start to develop and you'll see the vision of what we're actually trying to um, achieve with WordQ and of all, all of its accessory tools, you'll see that there's a component of that graphic organizer that's missing that we are in deeper than discussion because we already have a prototype of it that we'd like to see part of what we do. It won't be as extensive as an idea mapper, won't be as extensive as an inspiration, but it will at least allow a student to visually see the structure of what their writing is looking like. Okay. So back to this screen, uh, we were fortunate enough about 10 years ago now to actually present at CAST um, in Massachusetts. So we went and actually presented inspiration with WordQ to demonstrate that third component. So we are firm believers in what you see here on this screen. The idea there is, and Dr. Eddie Byrne, uh, who's pretty fabulous at UDL and pretty fabulous at understanding the underpinnings of how a UDL environment is to work, basically said, please don't say UDL is for all because you're never going to get all. You're going to have to tweak. And we completely agree. So the idea with WordQ is we can lasso as many different students with differing abilities, different levels, to be able to use WordQ the way it works for them in a customized way. Every student that uses WordQ will use it differently the first month, as they will six months down the road, as they will a year down the road. The idea is to begin it with it as a crutch, to assist you to get through those areas that give you trouble, and then gradually wean yourself off of every word and get to the place where you're actually typing in words freely and then using WordQ to do some of your editing. And that's where we truly see the power of what WordQ does every student successful in a way that they want to be or need to be using a tool that will work for them. Just a little slide here in terms of the process access express or the engage component here. We did look at the expectations and we did look at what the criteria are in each of those sections and you'll be shocked at how many of these things are reflected in the WordQ product. How many times you could read multiple tools for construction and composition and how you can check off the WordQ box and you can do that for significant amounts of those points that are in that UDL um, guideline. This one was uh, thanks to Rose adding and helping us to add the assessment component. But what about testing accommodations? We purposely about uh, six or seven years ago took stock of two larger districts in the US and two larger districts in Canada. And we talked about exams and we talked about how and what work you needed to be to be able to assist in those exams. Well, one of those pieces was to be able to turn off certain functions and you'll see as we go through this, you'll see the exam mode, how you can turn off certain functions so that the student is still getting the assistance they need, but they aren't getting those extra pieces of tools for an exam that might give them a little bit of an advantage. I won't get on my soapbox about how I feel about all that because my, my firm feeling is this. If anything I can provide for a student, it's going to allow them to truly show me what they know, why wouldn't I let them use it? And you'll hear a story soon about how I was a rebel and actually had my whole class using WordQ, even though only five of them were identified. Okay, so you'll notice um, great opportunity to be able to use it during assessments as well. Now, I also created, and you'll see this as we go through, but it's a little guideline for you. I'll show it to you. We won't go through it step by step, but I'll demonstrate as much of it as I can. Rose? Um, I was just going to say, I, I am in the process of doing a test with WordQ in the secure uh, SBA browser. And it's not completed yet, but I, I'm based on prior conversations with SETSI and other uh, neighboring districts that are using other products. I'm, I'm pretty sure that WordQ can be used with the second computer currently it, with the 
the functions turned off, they're not allowed. And then uh, an assistant would have to scribe whatever they produced in writing onto, into the testing environment. Now, that said, I'm really hoping that my testing will allow it to be used with the testing environment because it is based on desktop software and not based on a Chrome extension right now. It has an advantage over some other um, word prediction softwares out there that are more restricted. So I'm very hopeful this will um, work with the secure browser. And if you're, if you're, if you, any of you have access to doing some tests with that in the future as well, um, I'd love to work with you on that. And I'll keep you posted as I find out more. So I just wanted to tell you that um, some plans are in the works to have some more official feedback on compatibility with our Washington State. So thank you. Thank you. So, recognizing what we said about Maya Angelou's comment earlier, let work you help your students tell their own stories. And basically, once they're able to do that, they change. They evolve into more confident students all around, um, ready to take risks at a moment's notice, where maybe you wouldn't have had them even do that, uh, having them done that before. So, um, from there, we can move on. I'm just going to kind of minimize this screen for now, and we'll minimize. Uh, let me take, let's take a look at this one first before we go further. So in the strategic guide, here's what you do. And basically, it's step by step. Open up an assignment in Word and open Word queue over top. So you'll notice that I really went step by step to at least get you going. What we found, one of the most powerful things about Word queue is that within 15 minutes, a student can be up and running and actually getting that writing component working. Okay, again, with independence and confidence. So I won't read through this because I'm going to demonstrate a lot of this to you in the next little bit. But some of the other helpful features that we'll look at are the abbreviation expansion, hotkeys, and the topic list generator. So most students are going to stay, and I'll show you, they'll stay in that environment until they become confident enough. It's then that they're going to ask us for more. So by no means are you going to start with WordQ and say, here you go, go use all the tools at once. We'll be, def we'll be defeating the purpose of why we created work the way that we did. So we'll demonstrate that for you in a bit. And there's this one that you can use, which is a deep dive into UDL step by step. How do we get a student to write about fossils if they know nothing about fossils? Okay, so that's what you've got as a guideline. And that's pretty much the plan I'm going to use for the next half an hour to 35 minutes. Okay, hopefully that's clear. Um, so first and foremost, um, let's jump in here. This is WordQ. This is a Word document open below WordQ. All it is is five tools that basically allow you to uh, get writing or get listening as quickly as you can. So very first and foremost, let me show you what you can do by just highlighting text and hitting the read button. When you listen, you can hear if words are spelled wrong. Just wanted to make sure you could hear that okay, but you notice unit by unit highlighting. You notice that she is non-biased. She's going to read it exactly the way that you've written it, with pauses where you've put pauses, with punctuation where you've put punctuation, and with incorrect spelling where you've put incorrect spelling. Now, we also have the ability of the word processor to help us along the way. Grammar issues that might not work, spelling issues that may or may not be wrong. We can't always rely on that. One of the biggest components that we found in the research when it was first created was that the dual modality is essential. Visually, you can see. Auditorily, you can hear. What you miss with your eyes, you don't miss with your ears in most cases. So having those two components working together is vital to the success of the student. Rose? You were talking about the proofreading ability, and that's something I wanted to learn more about. So are the green and the red lines that we see there right now, are those from Microsoft Word, or are those Word Q feedbacks? Those will be, now remember, we're working over top of another program, which means the right. proprietary a situation that that program that we're using, we can't break into. But what we can do is we can take the text, we can take the keyboard functionality and remember it in Word queue. So I can't put anything on that page. That's all Word. And whatever other page you're on, if you turn on spelling and grammar, you're going to get some kind of a feedback from that program. Word queue is nothing without a companion software. Work you alone is nothing. Once you have that companion software where you can actually put text in, now you've got something powerful that we can capitalize on. So that's a great question. So again, one was being able to highlight and read back. And if I jumped onto the internet just really quickly here, even into my slide, and I highlighted some text. 
speech feedback, proofreading, enhanced topical web searches. So you'll see that I can still access text anywhere I am, but when I'm in an environment that I cannot control the text box because of proprietary reasons, I still get. Word has been used around the world in classrooms, homes and offices to help people read and write better. So I still get the accessibility component that I require to be able to understand that text, gain that information and access it so that I can use it for something else. So that's reading, just highlight and read. But we do have, as Rose mentioned, something called an edit mode. I can click in a sentence anywhere. So my cursor is flashing before the word can. I can click the read button. It highlights the entire sentence for me. Now I take my space bar and I turn it on by pressing it and off by pressing it. Watch what happens as I start it. When you listen, you can hear. Stop, start. You can hear if the words are spilled. So I can hear it, I can see it. And if I go back, you listen, you I can go left with my arrow key. You. Right with my arrow key. Listen, you can hear if words are spilled. Ah, spilled. I can see it, something wrong with it, but I can also hear it. So I'm able now to get information and know there's something wrong. And I'll show you very shortly when we start with the prediction, how I can make those corrections, right? One way is to go back to when it says, when you listen, you can hear. Well, I know that in my voice, I'm pausing a little bit. So let me put a comma there. All of a sudden the grammar situation goes away, but now I can listen to it again and press my space bar. When you listen, you can hear if the words are spilled wrong. So notice she paused. And she paused enough that it tells me that that's the proper place for that comma to be. Let's go to the next sentence and read that one back. So I go use my down arrow and I hit the space bar. As well, grammatical problems is easy to hear too. So now you know that you're starting to hear some issues. Let's listen to the next one. You can hear when word words are missing or if they not belong. Most times students would miss that with their eyes and we've had situations where that happened. My own daughter did it. She's a great writer, came home and got like a C on her writing. And she said, Dad, but this is what I, I wrote. And she read it to me. It sounded beautiful. But she's filling in words because her eyes are missing things. The minute we put it into work queue and had Heather read it back or Ryan read it back, she realized that she had forgotten some words or added some words that didn't need to be there. Again, we miss with our eyes, but we don't miss with our ears in most cases. Okay, this one is probably the best example. So hit read, space bar. Run on sentences are also a big problem for many students. You will always hear when you have written one because the computer will sound like it needs to take a deep breath. That actually came from a student who we had that go through and he said that computer needs to stop. Well, how do we stop it? Well, we add some commas. If we give a paper pencil activity to a student and we say, go change the punctuation, they're just going to read it the exact same way. But if they got a program like WordCube, who actually pauses at those places and goes a question mark, the tone of the voice goes into a question at the end, it's going to help the student to understand that writing a little bit better. Okay. So in terms of, Rose, I just wanted to comment that um, I've been using WordCube what for a year and a half. I didn't know that you could use the arrow keys in the space bar uh, in that reading and editing process, which is really helpful rather than just always having to click read and stop and having to do it. So that was a, a new learning for me. And I just wanted to point that out that that's, that's really handy to have that additional access. Thank you for that. And it makes me feel good because I am what, 15, 16 years into using WordQ, and I still learn something new every day. So thank you. I appreciate that. So the idea here is that the reading component is pretty fantastic in terms of being able to have students access. Under options, you have what's uh, the option of speech feedback for customization. And I'm not going to spend too much time here, but I wanted to show you that it's in here that you can actually change the voice, change the reading speed. So in editing, when you're done all your work, you might want to lower the speed a little bit, make it a little bit slower so that I can process that information a little bit better. The commas will be overemphasized, as will the punctuation be overemphasized to allow students to get the meaning of the text as they move along. Okay. Um, Feedback and pronunciation tabs. This one is important at the pronunciation stage because it will allow you to change the way WordQ actually says a word. If you don't like the way it says it or it's incorrect, this is where you can fix that. Okay, so I'm not going to spend too much time just to show you where it is. Now, let's go back to our sentence up here at the top. I go in and I read that sentence. 
just like this. When you listen, you can hear if words are spilled. I'm going to stop at spilled, and now I'm going to double click on spilled, but I'm making sure that I turn my word box on. Now, there are hot, hot keys that are the F keys that are on the top of the keyboard. And I'll show you where you can locate them, but you can change any of them to anything you want to. Students love this because it's a quick way to turn on and off the words. Okay, so in this case, uh, I click on words and I have this. And so as I go to the word spiel, notice it doesn't pop up right away. Okay, but as I go into the word, and I get, try and get to the end as quickly as I can, notice that I get the root word. But if I go a little further, oops, and I'm not sure why it's doing that. Did that to me the other day too. Something with my program. However, that allows me to see the word and to hear it. And then when I jump in, spelled, spelled. And now I can be able to get those pieces that I require to make those changes. So in my prediction box, I get words. Out. I'm not in. I'm out. Words with a triangle beside them. I'm not in. I'm out. Basically allows students to be able to distinguish for themselves homonyms and homophones. Words that give them trouble on a daily basis, such as seem and seem, or there, there, and there. And it can be distinguished by a usage example that they can actually read for themselves to independently decide what word actually works. Okay, Rose? I just wanted to comment again that Students often, if, if they're trying to spell a word, especially students who's very dyslexic, and the spell check doesn't catch it the first time, they give up really easily. So I think the strategy of going back, clicking on the word, and, and kind of going through the space bar, that, that's a strategy because, I, you know, sometimes I don't think of that. So um, as we're teaching any word prediction program again, helping students strategize, and it's not working from the first time, what else can they try to get to the right spelling or to listen to the phonetics again. Part of that, they're learning to increase their own phonetics, their own ability to problem solve and recognize the correct spelling. So thank you for going through that. The analogy actually worked really well when I was teaching reading at a very young age. It was, let's get to the end of the sentence as quickly as you can, because in getting to the end of the sentence, when you're trying to learn to read, you backtrack and figure out, oh, that's what that word was, because this is what it means. Well, take that concept and move it into the spelling in WordCube. If you go letter by letter, you're giving more clues to the program. The more clues you can give it by getting to the end of it, the more it works in context. Now, I'm going to show you in a minute that word cue is actually looking to the left of the cursor and to the right of the cursor. It's matched up words that normally go together in the English language and looks at the sentence as a whole. So eventually, as you continue to use it, it will only predict words that actually fit in the sentence without you even typing a letter. So for instance, if I jump into the word here, notice I didn't give it a letter yet, even though I'm just before the word if. It's saying when you listen, you can hear from, you can hear the, you can hear it, you can hear me, you can hear ah. But the minute I go to the first letter, now it starts to distinguish what it thinks it should be. Okay, and again, it does that at every stage at every letter. And the inward prediction of being able to go back to any word at any stage to see what that prediction was or is helps me to be able to do my editing on my own. Okay, so let me show you again. And I'm just going to go in and actually switch this for a moment because I want you to see what the default is here. So word queue will follow the cursor in the prediction box at the beginning as a default. Lots of students like that. Lots of students hate it. Students will turn that word box off until they're ready for it down the road. Students will take that word box and actually put it in place somewhere on their screen so that they can look at it if they need it, but it's not disrupting them when they're actually starting to type. So as I begin. Okay, so as I begin, that's the word I want. Now, anywhere where there is a diamond shape, you get synonyms, and the synonyms are also fully customizable. I'm going to show you where you can actually change those sentences uh, if you wish to. Okay, so as I begin, how do I select the word? I can either use the number line on the top represented by the number in front of the word, or I can just click on the word with my mouse, or I can use my arrow key going down the list and then click enter. So there's three different ways of being able to choose those. So now, this one's interesting. As I begin to I'm going to put the letter T, even though it's already suggesting two. When I put the letter T, do you see T-O-O? -O? No. 
Do you see the T-W-O? No. Why not? Because it doesn't fit in the sentence. And so we tell students, trust word cue. If you're unsure of which one, use the usage examples. But as you're typing, take a look at what's being predicted. If it doesn't fit, it won't be predicted in most cases. So as I begin to type the words, our digested for me. Now, I hit the space bar. As soon as I hit the space bar, which is what most students will do, here's what WordQ does. As I begin to type, the words are suggested for me. Without highlighting, it will read back the prior sentence. Why? To remind students of what the next possible sentence could be. Right? To remind them where they were, where they need to be, so we know where we're going in our writing. Okay? Now take a look here. As I begin to type, so if I double click here, type. really quickly I can find that correct spelling. But again, if I go letter by letter, and as I get to the end, type of same thing here. Double click. Words. He uses long words in his essays. Again, words. part of the definition is in those usage examples. It's not fully defined, but it's defined enough so that the usage example with the definition combined gives me enough information to be able to move forward. Now, this one's interesting because O-U-R is not even suggested. But as I go down, Where are you? I can determine for myself which one I want to use. Now, this is interesting. Watch as I go letter by letter. Okay, to the end. Suggested that four. The number four is an even number. That's not the one I want. But if I do this. Four. Look for it. That is for me. Four. The so, again, students can do a lot of that on their own as they become more comfortable with WordQ. And within 15 minutes, you can get them up and running. Now, there's a few other pieces to this. Under options, there's prediction. Here's where you can change the number of words in the box, the way that you set your box up. I'm going to leave it in place horizontally just so you can see what it looks like. I can put this at my bottom of my screen, and now guess what? It looks like my phone. How do you get boys who are teens and tweens to write? Let them write in a style that they're used to typing acronyms every day. Seeing the scroll bar on the bottom with the words there is no different than their phones. Rose? I love that. I'm working with quite a few uh, secondary students, uh, several in the high school, that they want it very minimized. So we've made the font small, horizontal, and put it way over in the lower right corner. My question is, is there a way to only have the prediction box come up as needed? So it's disappeared until you like hit a key and then it will pop up as needed. I, I don't know what that is, but is that possible? Hot keys. Show words, high words is F9. So we go like this. So you go hit the F9 button and you words off, words on, words off, words on, words off. F9, okay. that's what I needed. Thank you. All right. So under hotkeys, you can change those. If you don't like them, you can customize it to a different key if you wish. Okay. We believe students that we work with love the keyboard. As much as you can keep them on the keyboard, the better for them. Okay. Um, okay. So under prediction because I want to make sure time is going to be uh, working for us. So under prediction, you've got the ability to change some of these functions. The font box, just the prediction box, you can change the font in the prediction box by going to this font button at the top. Change the size and the font. I won't do it now. Just change the size and say OK and OK. And now watch this. Now it's quite large. And then again, Rose, you mentioned that you can make that smaller if you wish as well. So I'm going to go back in just to kind of minimize that again because it's too large for me. Maybe we'll leave it there. But your other options are, um, again, for customization. There's a whole bunch of different things you can do. You can change the number line as the selection tool over to the numeric keypad if you wish as well. Okay? Now, without rushing too much, there is another button here called My Words under Options. And under My Words, this is where you can look at a spelling list. Students can clean that out every month. It'll give you an idea of where they're making mistakes. Words that are actually correct, add them to the list. Words that are not correct, delete them from the list. Okay, so I usually do that every month. Topic creation, 
Okay, the ability to create topic lists. I won't go through this right now, but it's in our videos and you have the ability to streamline the prediction boxes so that those words that you need at that moment for that topic are in a static topic list. Okay, abbreviations is pretty cool. This is where I was talking about the teens and the tweens. Type in LOL, write the expansion down below, laugh out loud, watch this. As I type out LOL, hit my space bar magic space bar in word queue. As soon as I click it, it types out that entire acronym. So imagine making a list of 50, which we've done with especially teens and tween boys. And we made a list of acronyms that they could use in their writing, the name of their school short form, the name of the, the organization that they play sports with, uh, the street that they live on. So now all of a sudden that working memory that was an issue before is not an issue anymore because they can use the acronyms to get all their ideas out. And guess what? because it writes it all out if they're going to get credit for what they know they won't have to worry that my teacher won't know what lol is because they're too old and they don't understand the new age way of being able to to communicate so we're tapping into something they do every day to motivate them to write the way that we need them to write okay so i'm going to just let you see and notice that under my words pretty heavy topics here this shows you all the words that are in your vocabulary list when you click on one of those words, you'll notice whether it has a usage example, a synonym, or nothing. If it has any of those, just come in the box, change it, make sure you select the proper one, either synonym or usage, it changes it in the prediction list. That's how you can customize the list for the student. This number after a year will grow significantly. So you don't have to worry about moving a student from intermediate to advanced, the program will do it on its own, okay? So we'll leave this section for now only because we want to save time. If I go to options down below, Rose, go ahead. Um, this is super helpful to get into this. These are the parts I don't know as well. And because we're a small group and we're recording, if you need a few extra minutes, by all means, take the time you need so that we have this all recorded because I think it's great. This will okay. be great for screening purposes. So. That's really good to know. So that's awesome. So what I will do then is I'll go back to my words just to kind of demonstrate to you what's happening here. Okay, so in this essence, where you start the student matters somewhat, where you, because you need to have a dictionary to begin with. I kind of explained this to Rose the other day, and I hope I did a clear job. The way WordQ works, if we predicted all 80,000 words at, right up front, we would probably lag in our prediction. It would take four or five keystrokes to get what we want. Okay, so we recognize that students at various ages have a capacity of frontal lobe words that they use on a daily basis. So in a starter dictionary, let's say, there's 5,000 words in our starter dictionary. That's probably up to about third grade, maybe second grade. Then you get your intermediate, which is about 10,000 upfront words that they would use every day. And that's probably second grade to about seventh grade. And then we have an advanced, which takes us from about seventh grade up to about 12th. And then our WordQ Pro takes over from there. So what it does is it allows the prediction to be exceptional at that emerging stage. And as they become more confident, as they become more ready for other words, here's how WordQ works. It uses those words first. Let me give you the analogy. If we were all sitting in a room talking about Halloween, we wouldn't have to think too much about what those words are because we use them every day. So our brains very quickly can recite those words and pick them up. That's the front dictionary of WordQ. The minute we start top, talking about a specific topic, politics, medicine, where words are specific to that topic that are a little bit higher level, our brains work quite quickly. Goes to the back, pulls out of that file, brings it to the front, and for the next little while, that becomes part of our daily use words. Why? Because that's the topic we're talking about. That's word cue. The difference is once you bring it up to that front dictionary one time, and you don't have to do this, is doing it on its own. It becomes part of your vocabulary. That's why this list is at 10,660. It started at 10,000, and already 660 words have been added. Why? Because they're outside the scope of that front dictionary. Now it's being built, and that's how it grows with the student as it moves forward. So hopefully that's a really nice way of seeing the analogy. That's the way it works so we don't overwhelm the student, but we challenge them enough to use those higher level words every day. Okay. Spelling I talked about, topics, really interesting. Basically, the way it works is that you go to the website that you want to take info from, and you highlight as much text as you want. 
And I use Word, uh, Wikipedia for this a lot. And the reason for that is because Wikipedia has a ton of words that actually work quite well for me. So I copy as much text as I want on that topic. And then I come in here and notice what I did. I created fossils and then I learned from the clipboard. And when I learn from the clipboard, it actually puts it into lists that I'm able to then get my topic list and have it be available for me. When I close it and I have it, it's located right here under my toolbar. When I click on fossils, those 200 words now get priority in my prediction list and allow me to get access to those words first before anything else. So again, tapping into that working memory issue that students might have. Let's get the word quick. Let's get it out quick because if I don't, it's lost. Okay. So let's go back now to options and down to the exam mode. Notice the black and yellow line at the top. If a student is in exam mode, you will know because that black and yellow line across the top will actually be located right here, right underneath the name of the profiled student in black and yellow. So you'll know they're in exam mode. And once you're in exam mode, a lot of these pieces will be turned off. And I'll let you take a look at some of those on your own. We kind of took a consensus from those four larger boards and they told us that uh, to a T and to a district, these were the ones that were all in agreement. They couldn't be on during exam mode. The two at the bottom with the white box, which is worst word usage examples and single words added by the user, including topic words, they kind of were a little bit of a discrepancy in those four districts. So we left them as options. This works on time. You can set it from one hour all the way to 10. The only way a student can get out of exam mode is to turn the computer off and turn it back on again. But you'll have a clue because that black and yellow line will not be on their toolbar. And because it's not there, you know they're not in exam mode anymore. Okay, the other way is to let the time elapse. Once the time elapses and they try to get back in word queue, it'll open up in regular form. Okay, pretty good so far. All right, under the preferences, sorry, under the help menu, uh, word queue user guides, video tutorials, they're all right there for you. You click on them, you'll get everything I've spoken about. You can go to those sections specifically, get the information you need, maybe in a little short snippet of a video and get the ability to be able to get that assistance. And that's all available to you right there. Okay. All right. Any questions about that so far? Uh, just quickly, where can you show again where you set that main dictionary level? Right. So at the very beginning, the very first time that you use WordQ, a student will come in and it will look like this. You don't have to click anything. It'll just open up to this window. And then you follow the wizard. So next, which dictionary do you want? Well, I want a U.S. dictionary because you'll get a Spanish one included in yours as well. You can have a Spanish dictionary and a WordQ profile together where you can go in and write in Spanish and get Word. Uh, prediction and speech feedback in Spanish or close that one down and open the user that has your English and be able to get your English the same way. Okay, you can't, you can't toggle in the program. You actually got to close one user and open the other user. Okay, so here you've got advanced. Again, 15,000 words up front, 80,000 in the back. Intermediate, 10,000 up front, 80,000 in the back. And starter, 5,000 up front and 80 in the back. So you select the one that you want. In this case, I'll select advanced and I'll say next. Here are the voices. You get to choose Heather or Ryan. Okay, here's Ryan. Oops, let me do that again. New user, next. English US, advanced. Let's choose Ryan, try it. I am very pleased to talk with you. Or. As one child said, scratchy mommy voice or creepy grandpa voice. So, and you won't always get males choosing the male and females choosing the female. You get a lot of times the opposite of those two. Now, those are the voices that we add. But if you've got other voices on that PC, such as Microsoft voices that you like better, then by all means, we can use those. Just click on the proper one and go ahead. Okay. In this case, I'm going to leave Heather. Once you've saved it, now it wants to save your vocabulary list. Notice I have a ton of users in my vocabulary list. There's five or six here. In my other profile, I've got like 30. Why? Because this is a standalone machine, meaning that multiple people use this machine over and over again. The last person to use WordQ, once you open it, will be the profile that comes up. So students have to learn how to be able to go in to find their profile if you're in a standalone environment. 
if you're in a networked environment, which I assume most of your districts are, they use their login to log into their own profile. Once they log in, only their WordQ profile will come up. They will not have anybody else's that they can access. So it's pretty protected in that regard. Okay, so I'm going to just cancel here, but normally you would save it. And you'll notice that at the very top on the left, the name that you selected will come up. That tells the student if they're in the proper profile. Does that cover it, Rose? Yes, sorry, okay. I was writing a chat just about Not, doing a little extra stuff. So. That's awesome. Okay, so most students are going to stay here, and this is what my document will tell you. The emerging writers are going to stay here, right here. Word, word processor, uh, could be chat session, could be on the internet, wherever that cursor is flashing, word queue over top. Why? Because it's all they can really handle at that moment. And for some students, they'll tell you when they're ready to move on, or you'll know when they're ready to move on. And by that, I mean this. Some students have come to us and say, uh, hey, close off guys or Mr. D, I need more information. I don't have enough information for that wall of white that is in front of me. I don't know what to put there. It's enough to freak them out sometimes. And so what we want to do is we want them not only to bring their experiences to the writing, but we want them to go find information as quickly as they can, easily as they can, appropriately as they can. So one of the first things we teach is this. I'm going to move my word processor up to the top. And I'm actually going to turn my word prediction just a little differently so you can see it the way I think it works, works best. I'll do OK there. And now I'm going to open my Google Docs, and I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to set them up in what I call shades. So just like the shades on your window, we're going to teach students how to be able to, and they know how to do this, so it's just a reminder, so that I can see everything. So far, I can see my writing up at the top. I can see my Google search down at the bottom or whatever your default browser is. And then I'm going to move, move WordQ over to the top left-hand side because now I'm setting up best practice situation for students. I can see everything. I don't have to worry about clicking and missing and having something hide. It's all gonna be there. I'm just gonna learn how to focus on the section by raising or lowering the shade to give myself more room. And all it is is clicking and dragging. So click, raise the shade, lower the shade. So now I can still see everything. Over here on the left-hand side, you'll notice a little purple asterisk. And remember what I said, you will not introduce this to students until they're ready. Again, in stages, right? I'm going to turn that purple box on. And that brings in, purple star brings in a box called my dynamic topic list. And in my dynamic topic list, this is similar to the topic list that I showed you earlier, but this one is in real time. And what it does is it gives me words that aren't predicted or suggested words. These are words that are actually thought connected that somebody would have used to write about the topic that I need to look at. So today I'm going to go ahead and actually do something different. Nick will be surprised. But I'm going to type in with my word prediction box ready. I need help to spell the word minerals. So. Mineral. Minerals. That's the one I want. Minerals. And now when I have it, I click the green check mark. Down below. I have 75 words that people will have used to write about minerals on the internet. 75 of the top words. Well, how do I know that? Well, down below, there's a little black arrow. It's giving me anywhere from 25 up to 200 words, depending upon the level of student I am and how much I can handle. The default is 75. The default is also mid-academic level. It's not tied directly to a grade level because we know that those are they're not consistent across districts, across countries, across continents. They're different in terms of what that academic level might be. But you'll notice that as I click on the lower academic level, these words become very, very, very simple. 75 of the most simple words. If I click 25, these are the 25 most simple words in alphabetical order. Notice the extreme opposite. 200 words at a high academic level. Now you're getting into things like chemical properties. You're getting into Cyprus. You're getting into good examples. And each one of them is tied to minerals in one way, shape, or form. So the power behind word queue and thought queue here is that I can find words in this list and actually know which words are connected to minerals and why. So number one, I can validate my own information. And number two, I can find new connections that I can find new things to write about that topic that will make my writing a little bit more original than somebody else's. Rose? 
Um, do you need to take that list and turn it into a topic dictionary for them to show up in the prediction list or is it no. automatically? That's a great question. So remember, we did static topic lists from the WordCube program, which you can create as many of those as you want and turn them on from the bottom of the list here where the arrow is at the top or this one, which changes in real time. And what I found a lot of teachers doing is they'll start with these real time lists and then realize that we're going to be writing on this topic for quite a while. So they'll take that list and they'll make a static word list out of it which is very simple and easy to do. It sounds difficult, but it really isn't. But the key for this for me is that if I want to go back to that minerals list again, I can always just type minerals there and get that same list. So you can do it in two ways. Whatever works best for that student, that's the way that we should suggest that they do it. But until they try both ways, we won't know that. So that, that dynamic list that's showing there right now, as I type with WordQ, WordQ is looking at that list as it's predicting. Yes, so you'll notice, so let's go over here and let's look at the word. And that's a really great point. So it's actually influencing this prediction box and you'll see why in a moment. I'm going to type the word abundance. Notice the color, purple. The words that are purple in this list are reflective of my words that are on the left. And the reason for that is the purple asterisk is representative of that. Anything purple in my prediction box is being directly influencing the prediction box by saying, take these 75 words and give them priority so that as you're starting to type, they get first. You'll get them within a keystroke and a half. Okay. That's the average as you continue to use word queue. If yeah. I change that topic list, abundance won't be one of those words again. It'll be the words that are now in that list that will take precedence. Okay. So it's real time, real time words, real time connections to words that are there. So. Let me very quickly take you through. Chromium. I don't know what chromium is, although I do, but if I'm a student, I don't know the definition of chromium. So I'm going to click on it. I can hear it. Chromium. Chromium. I can hear it. I can see it. Again, accessibility everywhere. Turn on the definition box. The definition box will now take Google, and I'll raise my shade on Google so you can see it a little bit better, and look what I get. Automatically, there's a definition that comes up. I can use my read function on WordQ to read that back. The chemical element of atomic number 24, a hard white metal used in stainless steel and other alloys. I'm going to copy that because you know what? I'm allowed to take definitions. So first thing I'm going to do is type in chromium with my word prediction box. And notice that it's in chromium. purple. Chromium. And then I'm going to put my definition right below it. Why? Because I'm allowed to take definitions. Okay. Now, the next piece is the teacher might say, or the, uh, the activity might say, uh, go and find something interesting about chromiums and minerals together because that's the filter I need. The nice thing about DocU is anything that you access the internet from. So if you, sorry, if you access the internet from any word that's in my DocU list, you're going to use Google Safe Search or any other browser that's your default Safe Search, as well as us adding another layer of safety. So you'll never go anywhere that's inappropriate. You'll only get articles that are appropriate for what you're trying to do. Okay, you can take those words from that feeling safe. So in this case, I want chromium, I want minerals, and I'm going to click the magnifying glass that's beside the dictionary. And as I go down, I can find articles that are actually really good for me to use. So let me find one here. Minerals education database. So I might be able to find something here that's this is pretty good. It's pretty good because it's very simple and easy to read. So for most students, they'll come in and they'll do this. And they'll say, read. Chromium CR is a hard bluish metallic element. So I like that. I'm going to copy it. And this is what most students are going to do. They're going to come in and they're going to do this. And very few of them will come up and say, well, I need this URL. Why? Because I know <laughs> I have my own floor at home that are sometimes too lazy to do this so that they're protected, right? So, but again, that's where some students are going to stay with teachers teaching them that if you're going to take information, you're going to have to eventually put it into your own words. What better way of putting it into your own words than to have the prediction list of all the words that are tied to this area Matt. so that I can now begin to write things on my own. Now, I'm going to take it one step further. Now, do we have... Rose, tell me how much time we have because I need about five minutes for the PDF component and I need about maybe three or four minutes to do this section. 
10 minutes is great. All right, let's do that then. Elementarily. Need to do to finish. I'm good with time. Okay, so if you take a look here, I'm on this website, and it's actually a pretty good website, but a lot of them are not very good. There's information everywhere, and the worst of the matter is Wikipedia. Now, it was great for me to be able to glean text from it because there's lots of text that's appropriate and um, correlates really well with my topic area, but it's not very good for a student to be able to pull information from. So a page like this is not bad, but I can even make it better. This little R that's here is our Google extension, okay, which very soon will be working in other browsers as well. If I click on it, here's what it does. It takes that article and puts it into something called Readable View. And in Readable View, I'm able to actually look at this text a little bit differently. It might bring some images over that are appropriate, but for the most part, it's text that I can actually access without any other stimulus. So I can take a look at it by clicking on this Switch Modes button. I can actually click in here and then hit the read button. I apologize for that because I didn't switch the speaker over, but it's reading it out, but it's reading it in my headset. But if I had had switched that out to the speaker, you'd be able to hear that voice being read out. So what we say to students, and I get in an argument, and Rose knows this, with our developers all the time, because I told them the read button should be first, not the select button, which it defaults to. This is how it defaults to the select button. This should be first because we want students to read and understand or have the text be read to them so they can understand better before they start to interact with the text. Now, to help them, we can change font. We can change size. We can change space between lines. Space between letters for our dyslexics. If you have the dyslexic font and it's on your, in your Google, it will come up as an option. You can change the margins, narrower and wider. You can copy and paste any text in here and have it protected. Okay, so now that we've read it over and over again, now it comes time to actually learning how to summarize a document. I want to take, I know it's hard, bluish element. So far, so good. And look at the right-hand side of my screen. It's pulling out those words I'm clicking. The only or... Chromite, sorry, 99% in Africa. Uh-oh. Anything that turns red doesn't allow me to take it. So what's happening here is the algorithm. The algorithm takes the copyright rules and says, you're allowed to take 10% of a sentence, but you can't take too many words together. All that is in the algorithm. And it adapts for every sentence you go through and changes. So now 10% of a sentence becomes 10% of a paragraph, becomes 10% of an article, becomes 10% of the whole document. Okay, but it protects me. So I don't need to say percent because I know it's 99, but I want Africa. So now I get all of those text pieces that are on the side there that are now the key components to what I want to write about. Okay, I can move those around if I wish, maybe put Africa first because I might want to start with in Africa, found in Africa, but I've got all these pieces here. So now what I can do is I can copy those pieces. Now they're on my clipboard and I lower my shade. And as I lower my shade and I jump into my article here, and I'm going to just let you see what comes out. The title is here. Okay. I have all of those words, which again now are going to be tied to my list. Bluish, hard, any purples yet? Not yet. Or, okay, chromite. There's chromium, right? I can now use my word prediction. I can use my speech to text, which I don't have a lot of time to show you today, but the very simple component is that you can use typing and speaking to get all of that text out onto the screen in a very, very simple way. There's just so much to word queue. It's difficult to pile it all into an hour here. But the idea here is that now I even get the URL without having to copy and paste it. So now if I need to build uh, or put it into EasyBib, I can, and I can then protect myself in two ways. One is that I've only taken keywords that I'm going to write my own sentence with. Or two, I can write it word for word, but make sure that I cite it and cite it appropriately. So now what have I done? I've helped at all those stages of the writing process where a student could fall through the cracks. But accessibility is still front and center in every one of those stages all the way through. Okay? Now, the last component I want to show you before we uh, 
I'm running short of time here, is I'm going to close the topic list for now, and I'm going to go under options. And now I think it's the piece de resistance, but let's go through it anyway. Open PDF. And when I click open PDF, my whole screen will change, except WordCube will stay open. It's giving me a totally different box, which now allows me to interact with PDFs. So I'm going to click on, and this is an actual uh, OSSLT, which is a Ministry of Education document that's a PDF or downloadable PDF on the ministry's website in Ontario. Well, excuse me, and I just downloaded this the other day. So as I open it, I want you to see what happens. We're going to be able to save districts tons of money. And I know this, I can be confident in this because we work with districts on this specifically. Every one of your schools has a larger printer in the office that teachers use to make multiple copies of things. Each one of those is either on a five or a three year lease. So even if it's on a five year lease and it's five years old, it's going to have a button in there that says, when you want to scan a document on the top of that glass and you say, I'm ready to go, it will say, do you want to make it searchable or do you want to OCR it? Either one of those, WordQ will work with. So you put the book on it, you hit, you want to scan, it will say, you want to make it searchable, you click either searchable or OCR. Sometimes they have both, sometimes they only have one or the other. Once you do that, you can then open it up in WordQ's window. And when you open it up in WordQ's window, you get this. The ability to, okay, in our new toolbar, so select text, click that button, Highlight the text. Remember, this is a PDF and read. Change multiple choice answer. Erase or cross out your answer and fill in the circle for your new answer. Ensure that your final answer is clear. Unit by unit highlighting on a PDF with accessibility feedback. Okay, let me show you again down here. Here's the actual test. I want to highlight and I want to read. Do people depend too much on technology? Okay, so now I want to start typing in there because I know that the teacher's asking me this question. But even before that, the teacher might have put a little sticky note here as a clue. And they may have said, Use the example from today's class two. And I've got word prediction, uh, speech two. feedback. And when I hit the space bar, use the example from today's class to help you. I've got inward prediction. I can go back and edit this if I want to. I can close it. And as this is given to the student, they just have to cursor over the hint. Use the example from today's class to help you. I didn't click. All I did was cursor over it. So do people depend too much on technology? I get the hint from the teacher. Use the example from today's class to help. Now, if I want to start typing in here, notice I can't. I'm trying to click and it's not working, but I can add a text box. And as I add, and students know how to do this quite well. But as I go in and begin to type, as I begin to now let me just go a little further. Type. There's minerals, because Doc is still working. Mineral. mineral. It's the last topic I had in my dynamic mineral. list. As I begin to type with that minerals. I can click in there. I can change. I can click out of it. Now notice if I click out, I can't click back in until I use this button that's called annotate. And when I click and it says annotate, I can now edit. And it means I go back in and I can continue to write. This page can be printed with everything intact. If I open up the sticky note, I can print it just like that. It will come out with all of my annotations on there. I can save it. I can go back to it tomorrow and I can edit it again and resave it. So you've got the ability to use all the fabulous tools that WordQ provides in a, in a document. You can now use those same accessibility tools in a PDF, not having to purchase a huge OCR program because you already have one on those printers that you bought and spent a lot of money on. So a lot of the districts are coming back to us thanking us and what they're doing is dedicating part of a PD day to teach teachers how to actually scan on those devices that are already in their schools. And then using WordQ to do all the fabulous stuff that WordQ does. So in closing, because I know I'm over time, there's a lot here that I demonstrated to you and a lot that I didn't have time to show you. But what we tried to do with WordQ is set up an environment where students can begin here. 
again, this is the way we stress it. If this is where the student stays for six months, so what? If it's where they stay for a year, so what? But just knowing that they can use the same tool in a larger scale writing process by opening up the thought queue window, which by the way works offline 100%, the only connection to the internet you need is if you need to go out to get a definition or to go out to get an article or to go out and use reader queue. Otherwise, all of this works offline. They'll stay here for six months or a year or however long it might be, then you slowly introduce the next piece of setting up the screen to maybe this is your second step. Let's use Thakya to get information to put stuff on this page. And then maybe the third step will be, which is the way I, I documented it in the uh, handout that you guys are gonna receive, but the ability here then to be able to go and open up your Google Doc underneath. Now there's the third stage, okay? But only when the student's ready do we wanna make use of all the extra tools of work. By no means do we say, take it, give it all to the students all at once and hope for the best, not gonna work. Best practice says, do it in steps. Okay, and on that note, Rose, I think I've covered everything that we wanted to cover. Yeah, thank you so much. I learned a lot today too, which I'm excited to take back um, and just see, especially as I'm working with secondary and high school students, um, you know, give them a little time with the word prediction, probably not as much with secondary, and then really help them dive in to see how these other tools can help them produce uh, more complex writing, because I think we still see a lot of secondary students that are falling back to simple words because of spelling issues and because they don't have any ideas for, you know, what kind of vocabulary to put in there. So I can see this really helping improve some writing uh, once students learn it. So we're going to um, close up this webinar today, and this will be available um, with a link for people to view um, pretty much right away. I'll be sharing it out with some people I know were waiting to hear it. And then um, I know that John and Nick will be available to answer further questions um, from the company perspective. And I've really enjoyed uh, working with you guys to put together this webinar. So thank you. Us too. Thank you. Thank you. You gave us Thanks, a lot of insight as well. All right. I'm going to stop the recording right now.